Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Gulucky. Welcome to the 451st Imagine Greater Buffalo program and our 73rd virtual Imagine lecture hosted by our wonderful Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thanks so much for joining us today. This program is being recorded um, uh, and is created by the Center for the Study of Art, Architecture, History, and Nature, or Cezanne, as I pronounce the acronym, and ImagineLifelongLearning.com. Now, we're going to start with our speaker shortly, but first a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation. So if you have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again later on the Downtown Central Library's Facebook page and YouTube channels. And we hope you share the link with your friends and networks. So on to our featured speaker, Craig Delaney. Greg is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Architecture at the University at Buffalo, where he teaches courses in architecture history, building and urban analysis, and studios in architecture and urban design. As someone who straddles disciplinary domains of contemporary design practice and architecture history, theory, and criticism, and that of architecture and urban design, his work and teaching is consistently framed through questions on how architecture and urban design thinking influences our views on history and how lessons and concepts from the history of architecture and urban design can be infused into contemporary practice. As core research and teaching methodology, he is dedicated to advancing student knowledge and his own critically, uh, criticality through travel and other site-based experiences, running intensive domestic and study abroad programs. He is a graduate of the Ohio State University's Knowlton School, where he received both his bachelor's and master's degree. So now let's welcome Greg Delaney. Greg, take it away. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and, and welcome. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and uh, let's see here. Can everyone see that hopefully? Yes? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Um, let me just, I just have to exit full screen on. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, uh, so I wanna talk today about the Great Northern Grain Elevator, which is a subject I know has been in, um, you know, in the news quite a bit over the last couple months since, uh, since the storm in December um, that, uh, that damaged uh, the north facing wall of the building. Um, I hope today to, you know, put the Great Northern into context, although I know so much if you've been following the story of the Great Northern, you know, so much of that has been done through the news. Um, so I also hope that I'll share something new about, um, about you know, the building and the, the context of its significance, but also in kind of thinking more uh, opportunistically about its future and the potentials of its future. Um, and as long as it's still standing, there is a, a future to, uh, to talk about. So, um, so with that, you know, I think that um, the Great Northern uh, is a, you know, it, it's a familiar building type for Buffalonians. You know, it, it is one in, uh, of, of so many that, uh, of these grain elevator buildings and complexes um, that we find uh, on our Buffalo waterfront, out on Lake Erie, on the Outer Harbor, but also up the Buffalo River. Um, of course, the, uh, this is a very familiar scene. Um, this is at Silo City, where so much work has historically, you know, been done, especially in the last, you know, decade uh, plus, um, to really revive some of these sites that were once forgotten and now turned into spaces for arts and culture. Um, but I think it's important that this interest in the silos, you know, is not just understood as something new. You know, these silos were such important buildings when they were first uh, constructed um, that, you know, here's a couple of historic postcards uh, uh, that um, that just demonstrate the kind of interest also in these buildings uh, at the time of their construction as well as today, and that they're still subject 
of postcards in the city of Buffalo. And so uh, the notion that these are, you know, while some of them are still, of course, active working industrial sites, um, uh, the notion of, that they are, you know, significant to Buffalo's history and legacy, but also as sites that continue to inspire today um, is really, you know, is something that bears out across a variety of, of media and sort of is pervasive in our, uh, as a presence in the, in the city of Buffalo. A big part of that is, of course, that, you know, Buffalo is the city that invented the grain elevator. So you really can't talk about grain elevators anywhere in the world without talking about Buffalo, New York, uh, where in 1842, Joseph Dart and Robert, Robert Dunbar uh, invented the um, uh, electrified uh, mechanism for uh, scooping and elevating grain. And here you see the marine legs um, that extend into the hull of this ship. Uh, to elevate, to scoop out the grain and elevate those on conveyors up to the top of these massive, this uh, generation in the 19th century, these massive uh, wood crib structures for the storage of grain. And so this is an image of the Buffalo River um, and this kind of lost generation of all of those silo buildings. Um, and so the story of the grain elevator, you know, of course, while storing grain has, is an ancient uh, problem. Um, and so building types generated for storing grain is something that we could go back thousands of history to look at. Uh, when we're talking about the modern grain elevator, and when we use the term elevator, in addition to that, which is a silo, um, our story really does start. Buffalo, New York. Um, and so, and Buffalo has also then becomes a major urban city, as we know, um, uh, around uh, that early innovation. Um, there's two other cities on the Great Lakes that are sort of our sister cities, if you will, when it comes to um, the significance of, you know, uh, grain, you know, grain elevators and also as major grain ports. And that's Thunder Bay, Ontario, and also Duluth, the, um, the kind of port of Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin. Um, and these cities on the Great Lakes, uh, it's interesting because they're quite different than Buffalo. And one thing you might notice about these three is that they're at opposite ends of the Great Lakes system. And so, uh, so in what's maybe more revealing in this map from 1923, when you also kind of pair the volume of, of the movement of grain across the Great Lakes, across the system, uh, you can see that uh, this kind of idea of these two ends is really clear. And so actually Port Arthur and Fort William are the two uh, ports that uh, make up what's now known as Thunder Bay. Um, and then combined with the more modest amount of grain, at least in 1923, being moved from Duluth and Superior and then making their way to Buffalo. And while a lot of grain continues on its way uh, through the Welland Canal, you know, at this time um, uh, and uh, to Canada, but also of course still uh, in the Erie Canal and also connected by rail. What you also notice is that there's a significant end uh, to this this long, you know, snake of, of this the kind of thick black band of the movement of grain in Buffalo. And that's not only because Buffalo went on to become the largest grain port in the world, uh, but also the largest uh, flour milling city in the world. And so it wasn't just that we were a kind of, um, you know, cog in the transshipment of grain, but that we actually were a kind of end point in this system of transshipment of grain in which we also then built entire industries around what to do with that grain um, and the production of flour and other milling industries um, became also synonymous with the Buffalo landscape and building types emerged out of, um, out of those you know, desires as well. Um, just to put a couple images, this is uh, Duluth and Superior. Um, and there's actually, because these were sort of sister sites on this much larger chain of starting point to end point, um, actually the Great Northern, our subject today, um, has a sister grain elevator, uh, which is in Superior, Wisconsin. And here's that Great Northern Grain Elevator S. It was built one year later than ours in uh, Buffalo. Um, it's a slightly different type. So when we talk about the Great Northern here in Buffalo as the last remaining brick box elevator, um, this is not a brick box by concept of its materiality. This is actually wrapped in steel, um, but, and also its bend construction is slightly different, but nonetheless, it bears a pretty striking uh, resemblance to that which we're familiar with here in Buffalo um, of the same generation and the same company. One interesting thing that I've just learned recently in thinking about this larger system is um, one very familiar image here in Buffalo are the marine towers that you see on the right-hand face of the Great Northern uh, in this image. There's three of them. Those towers are the towers that extend the marine leg um, down into the hull of the ships to elevate the grain. Um, in Superior, Wisconsin, and here's a color, a present photo, the Great Northern and Superior is actually still in operation, but notice that there are not uh, marine towers. Um, and that's not because they have disappeared, that's actually because 
um, you would never be unloading grain in Superior, Wisconsin um, from a ship. You would always be loading because it's the start of the system. It's the kind of um, uh, uh, origin point as opposed to in Buffalo, the kind of terminus of that system. So it's interesting to also understand kind of variations in even very familiar typologies and parts um, that are different in a place like Superior and Duluth than here in Buffalo. Uh, but it's nice knowing that we not only have these sister cities, but that the Great Northern has a very direct sister elevator. Um, this is an image of Thunder Bay uh, in Ontario. And, um, and it's also interesting to kind of compare these because Thunder Bay and Superior and Duluth um, are both very different in the relationship between the grain elevators and the lakes. Um, they operate, they're a little bit arranged more like how our elevators that are located on the outer harbor are arranged, all much more in direct connection uh, to the lake itself. Whereas our elevators in Buffalo, while we do have um, a few elevators on the outer harbor in a very similar formation as at Duluth Superior and uh, Thunder Bay. You can see those long piers that jut out into the lake, into the outer harbor. Uh, by and large, for the most part, our elevators are all concentrated in our inner harbor and up uh, in the Buffalo River and up the city ship canal and other canals that were cut into this surrounding landscape. And so um, really as also a vestige of the longer history related to the Erie Canal and the kind of smaller form um, that some of this uh, early trench shipment took. Um, this is a map, these maps are from uh, 1939 and it's just amazing. I included the listing on the right just to give you a sense of the, the vast collection of, of industrial buildings including the grain elevators, this only including those that were considered larger industries in 1939 um, that are uh, all along that uh, Buffalo waterfront and also up the Niagara River up uh, to Black Rock and, and the Tonawandas. Um, and so here you just see that real extreme density, but it makes for a very different arrangement and a very different relationship between the city and our grain elevator collection and between the water in our grain elevator collection. And thus also the surrounding, this as a concept of surrounding landscape. And I think quite interesting uh, because instead of that system of peers, which we also have as part of our collection, what we have is this much more irregular configuration of grain elevators as the river snakes its way up the Buffalo landscape and also in relation to neighborhoods like, of course, the first ward across the river. And so um, uh, while we have these sister cities, Buffalo is really unique, not only in that it's significantly larger than Duluth Superior and, um, and Thunder Bay in terms of population and metro uh, statistical area population, um, but also in the, the relationship kind of urbanistically and in terms of landscape between the grain elevators to one another and the much more sort of varied and uh, even quirky forms uh, that these grain elevators then had to take by necessity uh, because of the relationship to the Buffalo River. So we have something that's really special here, not just in the idea that this is where the grain elevator was invented um, and that we've got this immense collection, but uh, in, a, in the particularities of its relationship to the landscape and to the city. Um, the Great Northern is, of course, today uh, the oldest extant grain elevator in all of those buildings. And so while we had so many, uh, we've also lost so many, some of those not due to any uh, disinterest in preservation, just to the nature that uh, for so many, you know, for really, you know, a good uh, century uh, that these elevators were being torn down and rebuilt as modern technologies uh, influenced the design uh, uh, and redesign of these elevators for the companies that they were built for. And so we no longer have any of the wood, uh, wood crib grain elevators that you saw in those earlier images, uh, but we do have this one standalone type, this brick box elevator filled with steel bins um, that is the Great Northern from 1897. And so it's both our oldest extant grain elevator and it's the only of its type that remains in Buffalo and possibly that remains anywhere in the world. Um, and in 1990 to 1991, the Historic American Engineering Record, uh, which is a federal record established by the National Park Service and, and the American Society of Civil Engineers and the Library of Congress, um, they did a report on the, this collection of Buffalo grain elevators. And I think, you know, while there are other cities that have um, uh, extensive collections, like I've mentioned, um, that there, it's really kind of a, impressive to understand the terms of which in 1990, 1991, that at a federal level, uh, uh, how they positioned the significance of Buffalo in that larger system. And they said, quote, in this report, which is hundreds of pages long, 
and includes individual reports of all the elevators you see here on the right, including the first, which is the Great Northern, um, and was the oldest at that time. Um, they, uh, in this report, they said that the grain elevators, quote, the grain elevators of Buffalo comprise the most outstanding collection of extant grain elevators in the United States and collectively represent the variety of construction materials, building forms, and technological innovations that revolutionized the handling of grain in this country. And so, I think what's important there is not only do they recognize Buffalo as the place of single greatest significance um, in the US, but they also recognize that a big part of its significance is not just about volume, is not just about numbers. It's about um, this range of, of uh, kind of evidence of various typologies and experiments uh, related to the construction of grain elevators across many different generations of thinking of these uh, silo uh, buildings and complexes. And so uh, so it's not just breadth, it's, it's very much also this kind of depth of specific examples and the Great Northern. And so that's a challenge to anyone who might think that the Great Northern, you know, well, we've got a lot of silos, we've got a lot of grain elevators in Buffalo, that's true. Um, but the Great Northern, you know, as by this report uh, rep is, is one of the most significant, if not in some ways the most significant, and representing a really important time in the way, in the uh, period of, of shifting ideas uh, in the kind of construction and typology of, of grain elevators um, in the city, again, that invented the grain elevator. Um, I think it's also important to note in this report, you see there's 20 extant silo complexes listed there on the right-hand page, page two of the report. Um, and this was in 1990, 1991, um, that, you know, while of course, yes, we still have so many great uh, complexes, uh, we are now at, you know, we've lost actually uh, more than 25% of those that are listed in this report from 90 to 91. And so the uh, amount of loss that we've seen in terms of continued demolition of these complexes is quite staggering. Uh, if the Great Northern were to ult ultimately be demolished, um, then we'd be at a 33% loss. We have lost a third of our elevator complexes since just 1990, 1991, when this report of its significance was, uh, was com um, compiled at the federal level. What's amazing about that report, though, is that it also uh, not only documents uh, in hundreds of pages of depth the, the uh, history of all of these sites, uh, the technologies, the materials, the construction, the uh, uses, um, the generations of ownership and so forth, uh, and also then the kind of um, uh, local, national, and international significance of these structures. Uh, it also documented them through drawing. And so they pulled together resources that were both historic uh, and also through on-site surveys um, that then uh, became a comprehensive set of documentation of these complexes. All of this also means that any of these, you know, we do have some that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places, but also then all of these are, are uh, essentially automatically eligible by the fact that this report already exists at the federal level that uh, documents so extensively all of the, um, all of these uh, complexes in terms of their significance. And so here's just a couple pages on the Great Northern, uh, and here the cross section uh, through uh, the construction, which includes its uh, steel uh, bins, uh, it's 30 primary steel bins um, with also interstitial bins in between within this massive mon uh, monolithic brick shell um, that is, uh, you know, a hundred uh, foot tall surrounding wall. Um, and even from the very beginning of this report, this is just in the early pages talking about uh, this kind of development of history, the Great Northern is constantly cited uh, for its significance in the development of the typology. In fact, um, the Great Northern, as this uh, only extant iron elevator, as they call it, or steel bin elevator, um, is, is really one that also laid the groundwork for the concrete elevators to follow. And so typologically, it really bears a lot of similarity, even if it looks quite different, uh, because it's interior organization and linear organization uh, and kind of compact arrangement of silos as individual bins. Um, is, is quite familiar with those that exist today. And here's the, the page document, all the iron elevators that once existed uh, in Buffalo, the Great Northern being the only uh, one that is left today, but also was always in the context of iron elevators, the oldest. And so actually sort of, and you know, by some luck, uh, we actually still have the oldest extant uh, iron elevator ever built in the city of Buffalo, which is pretty impressive. 
Um, and so this just another image to remind you of this, this earlier generation that we've now lost. In fact, at the time of the report, there was still one extant wooden uh, elevator uh, uh, complex um, that uh, unfortunately was uh, destroyed by fire um, in 2006, I believe. Um, but ultimately kind of moving through uh, the Dakota here on the left, which is one of the uh, most photographed of its time iron elevators. So this has also still been a uh, construction in the foreground. This is on the site of what's now known as the General Mills or Washburn Crosby complex. Uh, and actually the Great Northern is far at the back of this, uh, in the background of this photo, you see the Great Northern right behind that, um, that bridge um, uh, with its three marine towers. And so there's the Great Northern with an earlier kind of sister uh, steel elevator and of course the Great Northern. We also have uh, one that is of tile bin construction from 1903 um, that still remains, although more buried into the Washburn Crosby or General Mills complex. And then of course, the very familiar uh, concrete constructed uh, uh, silo complexes that we have in greater abundance uh, across our you know, uh, outer harbor and the Buffalo River. Um, the significance is also well documented, you know, not only as feats of engineering, but and I'm sure as most of you are familiar, and in terms of uh, the ways in which European architects and engineers also looked at Buffalo and other cities uh, across the Americas uh, for uh, their grain elevators and daylight factories. And so Walter Gropius, one of the most famous architects uh, in Europe um, uh, of the kind of European modernists, uh, started lecturing on uh, these grain elevators in 1911. And here's uh, the these are slides from his lecture notes uh, from that lecture in 1911, where you see on these two spreads, two grain elevator complexes, in, including the Dakota, which is number 65, uh, which no longer exists, and, and 67, that's all a part of the, um, the same complex, which is General Mills. Uh, uh, two of those out of the three in that set are still existing, including that's actually the tile complex on the far right. Um, and so Buffalo played a significant role in that lecture. Um, that was then published uh, in an article in 1913. Um, here is that article where you see several complexes, including also the Dakota from Buffalo um, and these emerging, you know, concrete elevators that have then by then been built for just only about a decade. And so still documenting this kind of emergence of these new typologies. Uh, and maybe uh, most famously in towards the book Towards a New Architecture by Le Corbusier, uh, where he actually took uh, the same images that Gropius published, but with some slight modifications. Uh, in fact, to make a point, he was editing out uh, some of the, what could have been understood as historicizing features, like the little pediments of this grain elevator complex in Buenos Aires. Um, here you can see in Corbusier's towards new architecture, those have been clipped off pre-Photoshop um, to really drive home the point of the idea of these buildings in, uh, the, uh, around the derivation of form through a, a kind of directly functional prescription. Um, and so here you see some of those images, but also in this seminal text, what is often considered the, the most uh, canonic text of the 20th century in terms of architectural development, uh, um, uh, certainly in the Western world, uh, Buffalo uh, is a part of that text. Um, Walter Gropius went on in 1925 to produce this uh, book, this uh, kind of as the first in a pamphlet series uh, through the Bauhaus uh, on international architecture, um, in which uh, what's interesting here is, of course, most of this is documenting uh, uh, various European architects practicing in this emerging modernism or international style, but he also also mixes in photographs of grain elevators within that set. And interestingly, there's one spread uh, with uh, examples 44 and 45, which are uh, cited next to each other on the same spread of, of Buffalo uh, on the left with the Larkin administration building paired with an image of a grain elevator, this one in Minneapolis. Um, and so this kind of juxtaposition of grain elevators alongside works of modern architecture, and in this case, two images, uh, even though while the grain elevator complex is of Minneapolis, um, you can really see this direct relationship in the significance, especially also of Buffalo um, and of these grain elevators, um, not attributed to the modernist architects and not even attributed by name in terms of designers as works of engineering, but then held at the same level of these works and uh, kind of uh, important and famous proposals of modern architecture. Um, here is Richard Neutra on the right, who is Austrian, but then ultimately immigrated to the US. 
Um, and he's uh, asking this question, you know, how does America build? And in fact, had uh, recently published a book uh, focused on a lot of these similar inspirations. Um, and here's just another spread, 52 and 53, of these uh, grain elevators mixed into the context of, of these modern buildings. Um, Eric Mendelssohn was the only to actually uh, visit Buffalo and published his book, America, um, in which he includes several Buffalo examples. And of course, this has been revisited uh, later in the 20th century through a seminal text like A Concrete Atlantis by Rainer Bannum in 1986, uh, which really uh, delves into Buffalo um, uh, with great depth in terms of the grain elevator and the daylight factory. Uh, but the influence in terms of uh, how these played a direct role in inspiring architecture and modern architecture specifically is quite clear in the buildings. Here's my favorite that very directly references uh, grain elevators and form here turned into the stair towers as access to apartments. Apartments, um, in this housing exposition in Vienna, Austria. On the back side, it's really actually kind of uh, uh, combining two types, the daylight factory on one side, the grain elevator on the other. Um, even as late as, you know, here in 1983, ultimately completed um, this uh, National Assembly building by Louis Kahn in Dhaka in Bangladesh, uh, also continuing this, uh, this very present form of the grain elevator, the silo, um, as synonymous with modern architectural development in the 20th century. And it became a subject for art too. Ralston Crawford, also here in Buffalo, um, and then even uh, recently in 2003, um, this these series, these kind of typological investi uh, investigations by Bernd and Hilla Bescher um, that include H.O. Oates, of course, unfortunately now demolished in Buffalo. Um, and so this is the context of significance of, of really not just local significance, but, uh, but international significance that we uh, are discussing when we're talking about a building like the Great Northern. Um, and unfortunately, of course, we're very familiar with its, its present image, um, though, uh, though a lot has been kind of misconstrued about um, this, um, you know, the, the, the significance of the hole in this north face because uh, the fact of the matter is that this brick wall is a curtain wall. In fact, the literature of the uh, Historic American Engineering Report refers to these as masonry curtain walls. And that's really how we should think of them as no different than if there were, this were an all glass wall that surrounds the building um, because it plays no direct structural role in structuring uh, the building in terms of the silos and all of the head house or cupola construction of the roof above. Um, and that's also really proven by an image or this lithograph of the construction of the building where you actually see in the background the roof and the headhouse being constructed on top of the steel frame and steel uh, uh, silos um, before the actual surrounding brick walls have risen around the building. And here's the, the plan. I think what's interesting too, the plan is spectacular. <laughs> here's, um, I think what's interesting about this building too, given its early uh, use of in the steel frame, this experimental type, is it's actually in some ways even more sort of usable um, uh, in, in more straightforward ways maybe than even some of our concrete silos, which we're now kind of uh, finding new uses for. And um, that's because this ground floor of the building, what's usually referred to as the basement, is actually very generous and open given the nature of its steel frame. Um, and you can see that also in terms of its height, it's actually a height of 28 foot six, um, overall, uh, which is super generous and again, super open. Um, and so, uh, so questions really are about, you know, what is the future of these sites as we, you know, think about them in a longer term where the potential is not just as, you know, sites uh, that continue to inspire in this kind of purely architectural sense, but that connect a much larger, mostly post-industrial landscape um, of global significance. And really what, uh, what many of us have been talking about is a UNESCO heritage level of international significance, that not any just one single building um, uh, uh, it, as the kind of center of that discussion, uh, but as this entire collection that spans, you know, our landscapes of the, the um, you know, the Inner Harbor and the Buffalo River, out to the Outer Harbor, down uh, through Tift, down to the former sites of Bethlehem Steel and Republic Steel, even connecting to other cultural landscapes like South Park by Frederick Hall Olmsted, and then all the surrounding neighborhoods uh, of the first where the valley and so forth. And so this UNESCO level of significance, um, I think is, is, uh, is a way to elevate the conversation around these buildings beyond just their kind of uh, local status as important to our cultural history and development here in the city of Buffalo. Um, and lastly, I'm just gonna end, uh, I know we're at time, but I'm just gonna end with just a number of examples very quickly. I'm not gonna talk about all of these, but just to say that the potential for 
rethinking these structures, not strictly through the lens of preservation and restoration, but through adaptive reuse, it has been well documented. In fact, this is a, a um, the nearest example, I would say, of a, a, a kind of early adaptive reuse of a grain elevator complex that many of you might know in Akron, Ohio, the complex from 1932. And in the 1980s, uh, 1980 was renovated as a hotel. In fact, pretty smartly, because while it's sort of difficult in some ways to have circular hotel rooms and divide up these spaces and you're sort of uh, losing some of the power of these uh, large cylinders, they did it in a smart way where this picture doesn't prove it. But if you stand at the other end of the street, you actually see the preserved face of all of these silos without the balconies and windows punched into them. And so this notion of still preserving the kind of power of scale and monumentality, these kind of cathedrals of the modern era uh, in the Americas um, is even still thought about in this early example of adaptive reuse not too far from here. This in Copenhagen, where they cleverly took two really massive concrete silos, and rather than infilling and punching small windows into those concrete silos, actually hung, cantilevered, because these structures are so massive, um, hung and cantilevered all of these apartment units on the outside, also then preserving the kind of power of this void of space um, and solving the problem of not occupying these kind of tight, high-shaped spaces within the cylinder. And so here's the uh, interior uh, of that, uh, of that, of those silo complexes in Copenhagen. Also in Copenhagen, they're actually kind of reinventing its entire waterfront around the adaptive reuse of these industrial sites. Here's a more recent one uh, that more radically transforms this larger, much more monolithic concrete silo in 2017, uh, but, uh, and here in the context, you can see it's actually this one in the middle here, um, but in this much larger context of rethinking these larger landscapes, in this case, really thinking about the adaptive reuse of this site as a neighborhood. And so, you know, I think what's important now is that we have conversations you know, about uh, all of the different options that we have when we think about these sites. Um, uh, one, of course, is a cultural landscape, but two also in terms of many different potentials um, that can fill a lot of different kind of visions for potential futures for the city of Buffalo and for our entire waterfront. Um, also as cultural facilities here at uh, Washburn A Mill in Minneapolis, the mill building was uh, destroyed almost entirely by fire in 1981 to the point of a uh, much larger demolition than what we have uh, in Buffalo uh, at the Great Northern with its one hole in the North Face. Uh, but even here, the kind of foresight in the 1990s uh, to preserve the building as an architectural ruin and then build within it and adaptively repurpose this as a site for a museum dedicated to this history in one of these by extension kind of sister cities Minneapolis developed around the railroad in terms of its uh, uh, grain elevators and moving grain from the Midwest uh, toward the East. And here's that uh, ruin of those outer mill walls uh, and some of the photographs of the preserved industrial interior where then you engage this, uh, this history. Here in uh, Zolverein in Germany, this coal, uh, this entire you know, coal plant um, that uh, was then transformed. And this actually a fabulous example of kind of uh, the intersection of modern uh, modernism and industrial architecture, but that ultimately was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2001. And I think what's important here is that even with its UNESCO listing as a very close analogy to what we have in Buffalo, um, that doesn't mean there's not opportunities to really rethink this landscape as a, as a contemporary 21st century cultural landscape, as you see here in the ground plane, and then also in the conversion and adaptive reuse of this main coal washing plant, uh, certainly tapping into the spirit of the expression of these industrial buildings here with this long escalator that moves you up into the building, much like coal moved into the building historically, um, uh, but still then you know, retrofits these buildings for contemporary uses, but still operating within UNESCO design guidelines as this larger globally significant uh, cultural landscape. And here's some of those uh, spaces under these kind of hoppers uh, much like the Grain Elevator at the Great Northern, uh, where you have this large uh, ground floor uh, exhibition space and still preserving all of the kind of qualities and working within and around that context for the display of historic material. Um, and yet some spaces that are just overly filled with machinery become just a museum of the thing itself. And so working these two things together. Um, and this has become a much larger landscape that has really reshaped this uh, this uh, uh, portion of Essen in Germany um, as a destination, uh, as a destination for international tourism, but also as a thriving kind of park uh, at the center of many neighborhoods uh, in, the, uh, in the city of Essen, and also then uh, re regenerating this landscape that was obviously once also so polluted as part of the intensive industry around coal that was once here. 
Um, this was really just completed last year as an expansion of a, of a silo complex by the Swiss firm Herzog and Demeron, um, again, occupying some of these silo spaces as a contemporary museum for art, uh, moving through some of these silos as you move from gallery to gallery. And so these become kind of intermissions as kind of episodes uh, in the circulation of the building. Uh, here at Lacaton and Vassal, French architecture firm that recently won the Pritzker Prize, uh, took this uh, much larger uh, hall uh, for shipbuilding. And I think this is an interesting analogy when we think about the Great Northern too, because while this hall is a big, enormous, empty space that can be used for lots of things, um, they still decided not to fill it with program. And so they preserved it as it was. Um, and so that it, uh, in this case, it can be a host to multiple types of events. But instead of then filling this with program, they built a kind of sister building, a twin to that, a kind of glass enclosed twin um, that then became the site for contemporary programs of uh, uh, contemporary galleries, uh, administration, labs, archives, um, that uh, rather than fill that space, um, uh, build this kind of glassy twin, kind of equal and opposite twin uh, to that exhibition hall. And one can imagine not just thinking of the Great Northern as a kind of retrofitting things within it, but also what we build in relation to it that might also introduce some of these new programs to this site as a, as a potential for a cultural site. Um, and, and here's some of the views that then this building becomes a way to celebrate and engage that much larger, still partly industrial, partly post-industrial landscape uh, in the port of Dunkirk in, in Northern France. Um, and here, just another example of something more extreme, where it, it can also serve in some ways still sort of industrial purposes. This not industrial, but, but non-human, uh, in the sense that this is an uh, uh, old uh, storage facility renovated as an archive, as archival storage for the city of Duisburg in Germany, uh, where uh, by the necessity of protecting the archives, the kind of program brief called for a windowless box, which invited the renovation of this building and then this massive uh, insertion of this much taller in the same spirit of this kind of solidity, massive monolithic brick, Abled form, uh, but then also through the brick surfaces invited this kind of new sensibility in the brick that also pulled this into the 21st century. Um, and last but not least, a project of recent uh, completion that's gotten a lot of attention is this, uh, this uh, really kind of um, interesting adaptive repurposing of this concrete silo complex in, in Cape Town in South Africa uh, by British architect Thomas Heatherwick, um, in which uh, you have this mixed use occupying a lot of the head house, but then also also kind of boring out, sort of voiding large portions of the original silos uh, to create larger public spaces from that much more cellular uh, siloed space, but in that still preserving the kind of spirit of these uh, and the power, the kind of monumental power of some of these spaces. And here's just looking up into them. So, so that's what I have, and I know we're a little over on time, but um, but just as uh, you know, trying to both recap the significance of this building, but also then um, that I uh, you know really what we're looking for here, and inviting I think ADM, you know, that's uh, uh, in the letter I was just uh, um, uh, signed uh, by Sean Ryan, um, really centrally inviting ADM to the table in terms of, of, of seeing the potential in the site as a celebration, not only of Buffalo history, uh, also of its own you know, grain millers uh, and grain millers past and present and the legacy of labor attached to these facilities. Um, and then how to think about these as evolving sites that absolutely can be repurposed in any number of ways. And so it's not about a singular vision, but really at this point in time, uh, trying to open up the conversation around the potential for this site as one that is inextricably, inextricably linked to our history and, and our significance in Buffalo, but also is part of this much broader international history that Buffalo plays such a significant role with it. So thank you. Greg, that was incredible and, and wonderful. You've, you've personified oh. our hopes for the uh, uh, Imagine series where you show us uh, uh, and tap into the visual beauty of Buffalo's past, uh, but then really stoke the imagination of, a, of Buffalo's future, potential future. Um, uh, just a, a brief word, because you were mentioned in the article uh, by Mark Summers that talked of the legal delay. Just give us a quick uh, up, uh, update on that, the timetable, what you think is the next best strategy uh, uh, in a summary. We're gonna go over folks our normal half hour uh, Leah, I uh, uh, 
trust this is you, the library will see the importance of the archived program to be shared with many, we hope. So go yeah, ahead, absolutely. Greg. Yeah, so just a quick update. So um, the Campaign for Greater Buffalo has brought, you know, the legal challenge to uh, the, the demolition order uh, by the uh, Department of Permits and Inspections uh, in the city of Buffalo. And uh, the courts have agreed to hear that case. They've done an initial review and agreed to hear that case. And the time frame for that is uh, April. And so um, and so right now, the, good, the very good news about that is that there is hope in um, that this building, uh, you know, despite uh, being issued the emergency demolition permit uh, initially, there is hope that that uh, that the future might be in some rescinding of that permit if the courts also view this case favorably and, and decide on this case favorably. But also, what it does is buy us time in the in the interim. And so, I think what's really important is is continuing this conversation like we are today. Um, you know, keeping this building in the news um, as 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 a continued conversation that we're able to have because of this kind of bought time, because as long as the court, um, as long as it's working its way through the courts, it means that there's a stay on that demolition order. So ADM cannot legally uh, currently demolish the building. Um, and so, uh, so it gives us time. Um, and I think just, you know, uh, in terms of what to do now, it's, it's, uh, it's time that, you know, we continue to press on our uh, local, you know, city officials, uh, both in terms of the mayor, um, in really seeing that, the, you know, uh, trying to evidence to the mayor that he does have agency in this process. Uh, in terms of the potential for rescinding this demolition. Of course, I know now it seems that we'll be just waiting to see what the courts say. Um, but also then on city council, there's still some poten potential, even if the courts decide uh, in favor of the city in this process, um, there's still potential for the city council to stay the demolition and order a demolition moratorium that is contingent on uh, further review. Because one thing that hasn't been done uh, is, an inner, uh, is an independent review uh, in terms of structural analysis. So all that was considered by the city was a report issued by ADM uh, and then a kind of cursory um, inspection done by drone uh, within their own office. And so nothing independent of City Hall and of ADM has been uh, put forward in terms of structural evaluation. Um, but then also, I think, demonstrating the viability of the future of this site, which I think we're already doing in sites like Silo City, in sites like Riverworks, um, that are very local, clear demonstrations of the viability of, of adaptive reuse. Um, but, uh, but even, you know, what I've heard so many times is the idea that, you know, something like a museum or other cultural programs aren't possible in a city like Buffalo. Well, you know, in Essen, that Roar Museum, for example, has seen, um, you know, millions of visitors uh, in its first 10 years uh, of existence and in a very similar kind of Rust Belt, second tier uh, kind of uh, uh, context, much more like Buffalo is to the U.S. as Essen is to Germany. And so, um, and then also projects like the Mill City example um, that also put us back in a Rust Belt context in terms of demonstrating viability. So I think it's important now to keep the conversation going um, and to generate dialogue locally, but also then continue to uh, invite ADM to be a part of that conversation and also pursue independent structural analysis um, that can really sort of reposition the conversation in terms of the future potential of the build, the viability of, of adaptive reuse or um, um, investment in this building. Greg, thanks for that update. Leah, do we have any questions from the audience? We do have a few questions. Um, Greg, what are your suggestions on improving the City of Buffalo's Department of Permits and Inspections procedures with regard to emergency demolition requests relative to historic buildings? That's a great question. Uh, well, fortunately, I mean, the City Council did just recently act on this. So this was one recommendation that I have been talking about, and I know others have been as well, and so and was uh, clearly on their minds, uh, which is to make regular uh, regular inspections um, mandated part of the routine within that office for our historically and locally listed buildings and properties. And so what city council has done is pass um, a mandate that those, all of those locally uh, listed properties are inspected on a three-year basis. I mean, that actually puts, based on the current numbers of historic uh, land, local landmarks, it, it's almost one inspection a week. Um, that would be put on the Department of Permits and Inspections. And so that's a, that's a huge new responsibility um, as opposed to only responding um, in the case of uh, a report being issued, a 311 report or something that is in violation of the existing you know, structure and city code. And so, 
Um, so that's enormous. I think that's a, a very good early, um, you know, demonstration of city council's uh, hopefully continued commitment to not letting this happen again, you know, because one question is, of course, the continued efforts are on the Great Northern. Another question is, how can we not be in this position around another building in two years and five years and 10 years and 30 years? Um, another thing is, you know, um, is continuing the work to add these buildings to our local register, our local landmark, um, uh, you know, uh, listing, and also at other scales like the National Register of Historic Places and also the consideration of UNESCO, um, uh, which I, I believe is absolutely eligible under three different criteria. Um, and so that also is a way to uh, work with, you know, extend some of the protections, especially when we're also at the UNESCO level and in uh, complement to the local level, uh, extend some of the protections around these buildings beyond that of the, you know, the uh, permits and inspections office. Um, in addition to that, I think that um, what's clear in this case is, you know, the process in which an emergency demolition permit is reviewed should be also challenged. And so the idea that you know, um, in the case like AD, ADM's Great Northern, where we're really clearly talking about decades of neglect, that is really kind of squarely the reason we are here today in terms of the um, uh, the status of the building in its current condition. Uh, in fact, I think their report to the city really reads as a kind of admission of, of that negligence over the course of three decades. Um, and also reporting has showed how, uh, have, have kind of demonstrated how little uh, money they have put into the building uh, in terms of maintenance over the past three decades. In fact, less than in that time, many people will put into their homes <laughs> of a vastly smaller scale and significance. Um, and so, uh, so I think, you know, um, the, the process in this case, which is so clearly a case of demolition by neglect, you know, one question, how can we not be here? So on the, um, on the side of what constitutes a viable emergency demolition needs to be challenged. One way to do that is to, to make sure that uh, that process triggers an independent review. And so that an independent review and independent structural analysis is a necessary part of that process uh, regard, you know, for a locally landmarked building, or even potentially extending to those deemed eligible for landmark status, uh, to make sure that we're never just using the words, you know, the kind of biased, clearly biased words of the, you know, the building owner that is actively pursuing demolition. Um, and then also another avenue is to uh, mandate that, that the demo, even in the case of an emergency demolition, that it does not bypass the preservation board, that the preservation board cannot be um, discluded in that process. Um, and so that even something for emergency consideration still does need to be approved through the preservation board in some shape or form. Uh, because, but right now they're entirely bypassed in that process, there was apparently a call between um, uh, between uh, Comerford and uh, Gwen Howard of the Preservation Board, uh, but we don't know the nature of that call. That has not been made part of the record, and so um, that hardly uh, demonstrates um, any input on the side of the Preservation Board through this process. And so, uh, so I think there's actually lots of things that we can do to um, to interrogate the current, um, you know, the way the the handling of these cases through permits inspections, but also through other agencies within City Hall and also nationally and internationally so that we don't find ourselves in the same position again down the road. Great question, great answer. Uh, any others, Leah, real quickly? Yeah, there's one more. Uh, once the Great Northern is saved, what is the timeline for transitioning it into something viable for the community? That's a great question. Well, I like the framing of the question to say once the Great Northern is saved. <laughs> so, uh, so that's great. And I agree. Um, you know, that depends on so many things. You know, I think, you know, cases, uh, it could be as short as a number of a few years, or it can be as long as decades. And as long as the building is, you know, preserved and, and repaired in terms of the current issues and, and uh, uh, both in terms of the, the, the whole on its north face, but also addressing some of the larger issues of, of the decades of, of, of negligence and, um, you know, and, and routine maintenance, you know, we, what we've learned, we've, we've seen buildings like, you know, the uh, Richardson Olmstead complex, right, which is still, while of course there's been renovations of the central three buildings, that's still an ongoing site, but there's not the same concern that that will be demolished. And so, you know, ideally, obviously you want things sooner rather than later, but I think the, the, the core of this is to make sure that 
we're protecting this building for the future of many generations. And that could be a longer process. And I think sometimes it's important that it is a longer process than just a kind of short turnaround because you want to make sure that you're engaging, you know, community in that process. And also in this case, we've got a very close community, the first ward, right? Uh, and, and by extension, then these broader scales of influence of, uh, from local to national to international uh, in terms of getting it right in the future vision, you know, uh, what, to what program? I think there's uh, what I presented is an openness in terms of all of the various possibilities that one could imagine this site being transformed into. Uh, but whether that is something more actively, you know, neighborhood based or something that's more of park, you know, park based and kind of a culture uh, to something that's more of a cultural landscape in terms of museums, other facilities. But also the option is still on the table for this to be an industrial site. I think, you know, um, one question could be asked is, you know, how could this be a site that is of use to ADM? You know, they are still operating the flower, the adjacent flour mill. They operate the standard grain elevator down the road. Um, they've asked questions previously about the potential uh, retrofitting of this uh, building for uh, grain storage. And so I think that's another viable question. You know, we're not only looking at futures that disclude active industry. You know, this is also a site adjacent to the still active in industry of the entire general mill complex. And so, um, so I think everything is on the table, you know, um, uh, uh, once we see past demolition as the building's future and toward uh, any number of viable futures for this, uh, for this project. But I think more like the Central Terminal, more like the Richardson Olmsted, Olmsted Complex, more like the current future as we're talking about the Olmsted Parks in relation to also highways like the Skajakwita and the Humboldt. You know, this is a long-term conversation that will impact Buffalo for all future generations. And so we also want to make sure we're courting that conversation right um, and taking the time necessary to do so. And that's why every day, you know, minute, hour, month, uh, uh, in terms of delaying this process currently and continuing this conversation is so critical right now, but only as a kind of gateway to uh, opening this much larger conversation that I hope, you know, we all uh, get to have. Great, thank you. Any others, Liam? Nope, that's all. Good. You know, let's wrap this up. Uh, Greg, if, if we see our region, city and region as uh, heritage driven, uh, where we live, work and play, but within the context of a heritage driven area, then, then uh, a lot of the pieces of this puzzle, I think will fall in place, whether it's the Olmsted system, the Richardson complex, the central terminal, uh, uh, and certainly Canal side and the outer harbor, all seen linked together, uh, then we have a bigger vision. And today's program, you've really helped us, uh, again, respect and appreciate our past uh, with great visuals, uh, but also get glimpses of a future. Uh, and, uh, and you've helped us imagine. So uh, I hope this is helpful, this program, and, and the folks that uh, have participated to share it with your networks. Uh, the link will be available on the library's website uh, by this afternoon. Just go to their uh, archive, YouTube art archive, and let's get this story out. It's concise, uh, to the point, and, uh, and an exciting piece of Buffalo's puzzle for the future uh, to help imagine it. Uh, thanks, Greg. Well done, job, well done. And uh, folks, we'll see you uh, back next week. Uh, Let's see who, uh, well, we hope you're back next week, March 8th on Zoom, as we're joined by Mark Mortensen and Jesse Fisher. Uh, and they'll be discussing uh, the importance of historic preservation uh, 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 as they look at the Olmsted uh, uh, Richardson Complex. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about the census exhibit that is going on right now, the very first exhibit at the Richardson Complex. Uh, uh, so come on back next week. I'm Dennis Galecki. Be well and have a good day. Thank you so much. <laughs>